Okay, we're in we're into triple digits now, so I'll I'll uh, I'll get us I'll uh, have a start. Listen, so I want to thank all of you who are on the on the call and will continue to join uh, for joining today's discussion. The title of our talk today is Two Americas Emerging Voting Rights in the States." Um, so I'm Miles Rappaport. I'm the Senior Practice Fellow in American Democracy with the Ash Center and the moderator for today's talk. I wanna start with a few announcements on the Ash Center's behalf. First, the Ash Center wants to acknowledge that the land that Harvard sits on uh, was the land of the Massachusetts people. And this land has always been a place and a gathering place for community and exchange among nations. Secondly, I wanna let you know that today's event is gonna be recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the ASH website. And lastly, you're welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event. Please submit them through the Q&A function as opposed to through the chat. And my colleague, fellow, my fellow fellow, I like to call her, uh, Tova Wang, uh, will be uh, monitoring the, uh, the, the Q&A. And when we get there, we'll open it up for questions and Tova will kind of take the lead in curating and, uh, and asking the questions. Okay, with all that said, let me just do a little bit of framing uh, before we get started. We are about a year out now from the 2020 election, uh, which was a confluence of an amazing set of challenges and, uh, and events um, that were quite extraordinary. First, obviously, conducting the election in the middle of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was an extraordinary challenge, and it required a tremendous amount of adaptation and changes on the part of election officials all around the country. At the same time that those were being made, there was ongoing resistance to them. There were 400 lawsuits filed, a record number, and there were efforts to restrict and narrow the vote as well as to make it more accessible. And it was also the beginning of the, or more properly, I guess, the putting on of putting on steroids of the big lie, of the idea that voter fraud is rampant and you can't trust our democratic processes. Uh, and that was happening during the election as well as has continued afterwards. But finally, with all that, it was an amazing turnout, including large increases in youth voting and in, in, and in uh, voting, voting blocks that have been historically less turning out. 160 million people voted, 67% of the eligible population and 24 million voters higher than 2016. Voters also utilized all the means that were provided to them. 70% of all voters voted early, 45% were by mail and 25% were early in, in person. Only 30% of the voters actually came out and voted on election day. By and large, democracy advocates cheered this result and the election officials around the country breathed a huge sigh of relief that overall, in almost all cases, the elections went smoothly. The system and its adaptations handled the enormous turnout with a minimum of election day chaos. But not everyone cheered, obviously. And what has happened in the state legislatures around the country has since been a tale really of two countries, of two, two forks in a road that have emerged where different states are going in completely different directions about the future of voting. We've all read of the states where extremely restrictive legislation is passed and some of the state legislatures are still in session um, and it will make it much, they do two things. They make it harder for people to vote and they also make it easier for partisan legislatures to subvert the results of the election uh, if it's not to their liking. Very, very dangerous. At the same time though, with much less fanfare, a number of states have moved to make adaptations of 2020 permanent and in many cases to go even beyond that. So this is the kind of terrain that we have uh, want to explore today. And we have four people, two of whom are in the thick of the fights in their states and two of whom are leading analysts. And let me introduce them now because I think you're gonna learn a lot and enjoy a lot about what we're about to hear. So first we have Randy Perez. Randy is the program director at the Voting Rights, Voting Rights Lab focused on long-term strategic planning and based in Tempe, Arizona. He most recently served as the democracy director for Living United for Change in Arizona, Lucha, focused on advocacy and campaigns designed to expand civic participation in the Latinx communities. In his role with the Voting Rights Lab, he's been conducting a national listening tour of civic organizations to discuss their long-term vision for democracy. Randy, welcome. 
Mimi Marziani is the president of the Texas Civil Rights Project, a position that she assumed in 2016. In that role, she has been deeply involved, um, viscerally involved, I'll say, uh, in the fight in Texas against what Governor Abbott and the state legislature is trying to do to restrict voting. Also, uh, in her spare time, she is a teacher and a mentor for young lawyers, serving as an adjunct professor at the University of Texas Law School and also on the NYU School of Law Board of Trustees. Hennel Patel is from the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Hennel has led campaigns to restore voting rights to people with criminal convictions for early in-person voting, for same-day registration, um, and to end prison-based gerrymandering. She's now leading the Institute's redistricting work and also in her prior life was a law clerk to Chief Justice Stuart Rabner on the New Jersey Supreme Court. And lastly, Professor Jacob Grumbach. He is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Washington. His research uses statistical methods to look and see, on, to dig into questions of race, labor, and public policy. His book, which has not come out yet, is called Laboratories Against Democracy, forthcoming in June of next year from Princeton University Press. And he investigates how national parties have transformed American federalism and its consequences for democracy, which as obviously is keenly relevant to today's discussion. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is rather than have op long opening statements, I'm gonna address a first question uh, to each panelist, give them three to five minutes to ask, and then we'll do a little bit of follow-up and discussion among them, and then we'll go to Tova and to questions from the audience. Okay, uh, Randy, let me ask you the first question. Uh, I know that the Voting Rights Lab, and we actually put this in our announcement of, the, of today's event, uh, has been following the legislative de developments in the states really, really closely, and recently issued a report that showed the starkly differing directions that states have taken. Tell us what you found, and uh, how do you interpret it? Well, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really just honored to be here. I told my mom I was speaking at Harvard, and she was very excited, so I really appreciate the invitation and to be among such a a great group as usual. I think you made a mistake in putting me on with all these great folks. Um, but you know, let me let me just start by saying it's something that I'm I'm sitting with. I really believe in always showing up as your most authentic self. You know, the, the fight for our democracy is very real to us here in Arizona. And just while I have the audience in the space, I just want to uplift the stories of people here who are fighting every single day to ensure that we have access, uh, that we can participate. Uh, that includes Blanca from Lucha. Um, I wore this today to rep. Uh, my former organization, who I'm thinking a lot about and holding in my heart uh, right now for what they're going through. And a lot of other folks who cannot even vote. They can't show up. They do not have the same privileges as you and I. Um, and in this cu current climate, they have been ostracized like never before. So I'm really sitting with the fact that we have a great privilege to be here today. Um, and it's because of folks whose stories and names you're not seeing on the Zoom screen right now. And that's why I'm even here with you today. So thank you so much for having me. And just wanted to take that, that moment. And we, we love Lucha and we love everybody there. Um, you know, this, this tale of two democracies report that we put out, I, you know, I can get into the specifics of it, but this is not a new phenomenon that we live with, that there are people experiencing democracy in very different ways. This country was designed in that way, and it's always been about upholding white supremacy and the power of the elites, elite few at the expense of the many. Um, you know, this is showing up in a lot of different states this year. I think the national media is picking up on this story and telling it in a different way, only again, because of the on the ground advocacy and organizing that's happening in states like Texas and Wisconsin and Arizona and Georgia and Florida across the country and so many more, so many Southern states uh, that don't get the kind of attention that battlegrounds do like in Mississippi or in Alabama that are completely left behind and have always existed in an insane kind of warped idea of democratic participation uh, where rights restoration is next to impossible. Uh, where com communities have not moved on from Jim Crow in a lot of these places. Um, and that's the country that we live in right now. Um, you know, thinking about the kind of two democracies that we live in, we, we have never been able to fulfill this promise, right? When tens of millions of voters remain unregistered and who are even who are eligible because they don't believe that this was built for them. When we have folks in prison who have had their voting rights stripped away for absurd levels of crime and convictions that should not exist in this country. Uh, when you have undocumented folks who pay taxes in this country and are living here, uh, who aren't unable to participate. There's so much wrong uh, with our system today uh, that it's almost, and I think in this moment, it's really hard to get a grasp on how much is happening. I think the movement overall, I feel a lot of uh, dis disbelief, but also not surprised sometimes of like how much we're facing. We've been kind of screaming about this for a long time, what's happening. Um, and I think people are picking up on it right now. Um, 
you know, it's been amazing to see what's happening in Texas, right? You know, I, thinking about, and again, thinking about the intersection of so many different issues in Texas, right? What happened with the abortion law in Texas would not be possible without decades of voter suppression and disenfranchisement. What happens here in Arizona with the tax on our immigrant community would not be possible without voter suppression. So it's also impossible to have this conversation without taking an intersectional look at what all these issues look like. And the only way that we're going to win is if we all work together and acknowledge that this is all of our value, this is all of our issue together and push it forward. Um, you know, when I think about the tale of two democracies, I think about where I grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, you know, I grew up, I'm the only Perez in my family um, and the rest of my family is white. Um, and I grew up in a million dollar house on the hill in Madison, Wisconsin. I never had to worry for one single day was I gonna be able to cast a vote. I had never had to worry for one single day was my family going to be able to participate or was their voice going to be heard? Um, and it really wasn't until I moved to Arizona and saw the movement that has been built here from nothing. I mean, I think that we often miss this part of our democracy is that it's just people who were fed up um, in states across the country. I was talking to a group in Michigan um, this week um, who passed a ballot initiative around redistricting to create fair maps in 2018. Uh, it, they said it was 6,000 volunteers who gave up two years of their lives, no pay, the fastest initiative and now you're hopefully going to have fair maps redrawn next year um so just to kind of to kind of level set i think it's difficult to have this conversation as it, and I'm, I'm not saying that anyone's having it as if it's new um but this is the experience that a lot of folks have been having um and voter suppression and disenfranchisement i know that we're talking a lot about election subversion right now which is the you know kind of this practice of creating these partisan boards and potentially overthrowing the results of elections which you've seen with the audit that we had here in arizona you know, they had my ballot 10, 10, 12 miles away. The cyber ninjas in Arizona had my ballot here in Maricopa County. Um, and so there's so many different terms that we're throwing around, but this has always been the story. And I will say this to the report, um, you know, there are places where we're advancing. Right? Colorado has an excellent elections model. Washington and Oregon are doing amazing things on elections to enfranchise folks. You have a state like Vermont that is putting into place undocumented municipal voting in a number of different municipalities. Uh, so there are places where we're really living our democratic values and pushing for full participation, but there are many more that we're not, and there are many more stories that are not being told. I, I was talking to a group in, um, I think it was Montana, that told me a story about on an indigenous community that they had a polling place in a chicken coop, right? Uh, that's a true story that, I, that I've heard. I was talking to folks in Mississippi, in order to get your rights restored in Mississippi, you have to literally become a bill uh, and get voted on in each chamber then signed by the governor. Um, so I'll, I'll stop in a second, but I just wanted to say that that's kind of the story. I think it's important to hold the models of democracy forward and create that powerful counter narrative that we're actually for and not just being against. Um, but just the, the movement has been is the only reason that we're standing here right now to have this conversation. So thank you so much for having me. I, I really do appreciate it. Great, Randy. It's a great way to start off. And uh, I think I may come back to you and have a, give you a little more of your lucha time to talk about Arizona. Okay. Uh, next, Mimi, here's my first question to you. Texas is ground zero, or we should say one of ground zero, one of the number of ground zeros uh, for laws aimed at suppressing the vote, particularly of voters of color. Whole country watched the remarkable resistance of Democratic legislators to, uh, to the passage of the bill. Um, but what's the state of play now? Obviously, the bill passed. What are organizations like the Texas Civil Rights Project doing to try to protect voters in this really, really tough environment. Thank you for that. First, a huge shout out to Randy. I mean, we see Lucha, we work with Lucha across the state lines, and um, I completely agree with everything you said. And, you know, in fact, this kind of tale of two democracies is what actually brought me to Texas in the first place. As some of y'all know, um, I spent almost a decade in New York City. I worked at the Brennan Center for Justice, obviously an incredible institution before I came down in 2014 to Texas, originally to serve as um, in-house counsel for Wendy Davis when she ran for governor. And one of the things that has kept me here is exactly what Randy's describing, both the unbelievable need and the suppression of rights that I have to be honest, I think I was naive to think did not still exist in this country, alongside this incredibly vibrant multiracial movement um, looking forward and, and pushing for a better state. And, and in fact, you know, that still describes the state of play today. I mean, this summer, you know, there's a lot of good news from 2021 in Texas. We saw an 
unbelievably diverse and multifaceted movement come together and do something the entire country thought was not possible, which is um, stall and eventually um, kick out uh, the worst parts of an omnibus bill that would make voting more difficult. And, you know, just to um, follow Randy and giving a shout out to some of the people on the ground who made that possible. I mean, that looked like everybody from, you know, folks like Willie Nelson or the CEO of American Airlines to a mom I talked to who was um, in the Capitol with, um, she had printed out some of the analysis that we had done at the Texas Civil Rights Project and was going to testify on behalf of one of her kids who's a person with disabilities who would who would face new barriers under this law. So I mean it is all sorts of people came together to really create the um, political environment that ultimately led to the pretty dramatic um, quorum break and extended um, quorum break that the Texas Democrats did to stave off the bills and it did result ultimately you know, not just in a, in, a ulti- in a bill that was mitigated, but also I do think in some renewed power in this uh, voting rights movement. I, I think on, on top of that, um, I do give us a lot of credit in Texas for reinvigorating a national debate about the need for reform. And I'm gonna preempt some questions we'll get later. I mean, as Randy said, we've actually seen this show before. We know what has to happen when Um, certain states subvert democracy in this way, we need the federal government to to step in. And at this point, there's very little else that we can do on the ground in Texas. We we absolutely need national help. So that's some of the good news. (laughs) The not so good news is, um, has also been touched on. So ultimately, an omnibus bill passed, SB1, that creates um, new barriers for voting, quite frankly, for everybody. But the folks who will be hardest hit are the people who are always hardest hit, people of color, um, newer citizens, so folks from immigrant backgrounds, and people with disabilities in particular in this bill, and then young people to some extent as well. Um, In addition, because of that, um, you know, the power of this of this new movement and the, the power of New Texas that, you know, is, you know, there are, we're continuing, I think, to see examples of that. There is uh, quite a bit of retaliation that we are seeing right now in the special session that is ongoing. The, um, the redistricting process is underway, but the maps that have been unveiled are just jaw-droppingly racially discriminatory. That this state has been the growth, the two new congressional seats has been fueled by people of color. White uh, Anglo growth has, has hardly nudged in the last decade. Instead, we've had millions of new Latino members of our state, 500,000 new Black members, 500,000 new AAPI members, and the two new congressional districts somehow, and this is, I don't even understand how this is possible in the diverse cities, are both majority Anglo. In addition, um, after uh, former President Trump jumped up and down and said that he thought there should be an audit in Texas, There have now been um, both efforts by the Secretary of State's office and a new bill moving forward in the legislature to do an Arizona style type audit in Texas. And so, you know, unfortunately, while there were bright spots, I mean, we're going to walk away from this year with um, three things having happened. You know, one is we are slipping away. If if we were there at the beginning of the year, we have slipped away with from being what you know is is typically thought of as a liberal democracy. We have I, I don't believe that we have equal freedom to vote in Texas, and we are seeing a sustained and repeated attack on people who have less power, and that's of course people of color, people with disabilities, also women, as we've seen members of the GLBTQ. IA community as well. Um, And then right along with that, and this is also what you see in countries that have slipped out of democracy, our public policy has just ceased to reflect what the majority want. I mean, I sat in this house and cradled my two kids under six for days in February when we lost power and we could see our breath inside. And instead of overhauling our electric grid, which is in a precarious state, 
our lawmakers are spending time trying to, you know, roll back the clock on women's rights, as was noted, and, and other things that don't have anything close to majority support um, in the general public, including in Texas. And so, you know, I think that leaves us in a very dangerous state. And to go back to what I said before, you know, the, the organizing will continue on the ground. I mean, we have our, we are suing Texas, of course, uh, <laughs> of course, I do love that part about my job, of course, um, about the new law and we'll continue to do all that work. But this is a national problem that will have national ramifications and needs a national solution. Jimmy, thanks. Thanks so much. And uh, want to come back to uh, the, the law a little bit. Uh, Hannah, let me ask you, I mean, you know, you're in New Jersey. Obviously, it's generally been considered a Democratic state, although you've had some recent Republican governors. Um, but for many years, the fact that it was a Democratic state didn't mean it had voter friendly laws in place at all. Uh, that seems to be changing now, thanks to the activism of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and other grassroots organizations. But can you fill us in on the progress that New Jersey has made and how it happened? Because I think it's an important, you know, it, it is true and it's fair that the states that are moving backwards are getting the most public attention. But it is important, as Randy noted, to say to, that there are states that are moving forward and New Jersey is one of them. So tell us about how you did it and what's happening. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be on this panel and I'm gonna you know, um, echo some of the things Randy and Mimi said because I think this is the highlight here. Um, in all of our states, whether they're moving backwards or forward on democracy, we're seeing some of the same themes. Um, and I think it comes down to the core of this, um, you know, voting, voting rights is about power at the end of the day. And that is why it's always, always been controversial. It's always been fraught. And I think at its root, one of the biggest issues we've had and why this is constantly an issue is that we have never broadly as a culture in this country truly believed in the fundamental right to vote. Um, it has, from the very beginning, been always about who gets to have it, what are the obstacles we're putting uh, in place, what hoops you have to jump through in order to actually cast your vote. Um, and that's what's kind of bubbling over yet again, because at its core, this is about power. Who has power comfortably? Who is clinging to power by, with their bare hands? And who has to fight for it? Um, and that is what is going on everywhere. So here in New Jersey, um, I think the best way to illustrate where we are and where we're going is that in 2015, so just six years ago, not too long ago, um, you know, New Jersey, as Miles said, isn't seen as um, the worst in, a, in terms of voter laws, and it hasn't been in decades, it's been okay, but also hasn't been a particular model for voting rights either. Um, and in 2015, there was a big push amongst advocates um, and with our, our legislature, then all in one, um, uh, one party, to try to get, um, put some bills together, put a democracy act together to pass, um, get us to uh, get our infrastructure, get our voting rights to the 21st century. So they included automatic voter registration, online voter registration, um, early in-person voting, things like that. They knew, and it eventually did happen. It was vetoed by then governor Chris Christie. But the interesting thing then is, even knowing it would get vetoed, a couple of issues couldn't even make it into the bill. Rights restoration for people on parole and probation could not make it. They, they wouldn't have the votes. <laughs> Same day registration, couldn't make it, wouldn't have the votes. So we, that couldn't even pass through Democratic legislature in 2015. So what's shifted though? First, we do have a new governor and he did campaign on a lot of these issues. So that is absolutely one key part of it. But we were, ed but when we have these new term, when we had this new term in the last few years, each and every one of these um, issues had to be fought for separately, had to get, uh, get through the legislature. Um, and for a number of reasons, right? There are issues with county officials who are concerned with this. There are issues here, there are issues there. Then there are bigger, broader issues that everyone is dealing with stigma. Everyone's concerned about their own races. So for rights restoration, we passed that in December, 2019. Um, the Institute, a lot of our partners launched a campaign, the 1844 No More campaign um, to restore voting rights. 1844 is the year New Jersey first connected the franchise to the criminal justice system. And at that time, there's a question, what are you gonna, you know, try just parole, try, try just pro probation, do only parts of it. 
we went for full restoration said, you know what, on principle, we believe that. And also strategically, it makes sense in a state like ours, we should be doing this. But the only way that bill passed is I was there. I had, I went up and down the state with colleagues, with formerly incarcerated people. My colleague, Ron, I watched him share his story. He's a formerly incarcerated. I watched him share his story with p person after person in the public and legislators share the worst moments of his life in an effort to get them to restore his vote. That's what led to the movement here. Um, and so this is what it comes down to. We had, and yes, they passed the automatic voter registration, online voter registration finally <laughs> passed last year. And it's great. And we're pushing. We have early vo in-person voting now. We're, we're working right now on a campaign for same-day registration, which if you are in a lot of other states, you're like, how is that something you're behind on? We are. 20 states have it, and DC has it, but we are um, in a state that's voter friendly. Um, and we're talking to people to do this. So it, it's tough. They're, everyone's worried about their own races. Everyone's worried about things. Here's the difference though. One of the biggest um, changes we saw in the last few years is that more and more people are understanding the issue. And it has a lot to do with happening um, around the country. I remember in 2019, I'd have people reach out and say, hey, did you see what happened in Georgia um, in 2018? What are, what's going on? <laughs> What are they doing about voter suppression? What can we do about it? It's, and that conversation has just gotten bigger and bigger. And we're here today now um, having this because it's reached um, that much of a, that much of a um, crucial point. But this started three, four years ago where we have in New Jersey, white suburban people waking up who are pretty much used to, kind of comfortable with our voting system, as Randy said, thought it worked, didn't really have to jump through too many barriers. It all kind of evolved around them who said, hey, this is a problem. People are trying to suppress the vote. And I said, yeah, you know what we need in New Jersey? These are how many people we're suppressing. And they stood up and said something. People vocalized that, had a problem with it and said, hey, no, you need to do this, support these bills. So this is where we're coming to now. This is why we are at this point that we have progress. We're hoping for same day registration. We're going to keep pushing for full restoration. Uh, people, incarcerated people should have the right to vote, especially with how racist the system is, with criminal justice system is. Mm. Um, but the key here is none of that would have happened without people standing up and saying something or people participating. Um, and that's one of the key differences here. Five, six years ago in New Jersey, those elected officials could vocalize, could say why they didn't want those voter reforms. Now they're saying that in back rooms because they know it's not popular. They know it's a problem even in their bases, even in their, uh, um, in their constituencies. So it's, we have seen a shift and we're lucky. But I want to say one last thing here. As we're talking about two Americas and the emergence here, yes, there are states like ours who are doing better. And I'm so grateful for that and grateful for the work I get to do. But the differences that we're seeing here, the states that are doing better are not doing it at the same pace as the states who are restricting the vote. They're not passing omnibus bills to expand the vote in great ways. So on the aggregate, we're still moving in one direction. Uh, yes, as Mimi said, we need federal action, but we also need um, states who care, states who wanna embrace democracy to actually take a stand. You need an equal action here to the restrictions, to the restrictions, to the suppressions we're seeing in other states, and we're not there. There's not a single state who's doing this and pushing forward in a way. Um, there are different efforts happening, but yeah, we could do big things. We could, you could have a state that goes, you know what, we're going to restore voting rights to people who are all all incarcerated people. We could lower the voting age. We could um, do, uh, grant voting rights to non-citizens. We could do that in one fell swoop if you wanted to. No one's at that point, but we are at that other point in a lot of states. And that's a huge problem here. And I'll thanks. That was great. And uh, um, um, anyway, your 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 passion for people's involvement is uh, is is fabulous. Um, people of New Jersey, thank you. Um, Jake, let me ask uh, to you. Uh, you've now been become sort of really one of the leading analysts on the state of democracy in the states, and also states sort of backsliding. And I know that you've done a comprehensive analysis of what factors influence policies in the state, which I assume will be a core of your forthcoming book. So can you tell us what you found, how you're analyzing this and how it connects to the points that uh, Henel and Mimi have just, and, uh, and Randy have all made? 
Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, Miles, and thanks uh, to you and Tova for organizing and my co-panelists here for their inspiring work. Uh, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit and think about this more broadly. And um, uh, first is that it's great to be a social scientist around practitioners here. So I'm really constrained by the social scientific method, and I'm also a quant. You know, I'm constrained by what estimates from my statistical models say. So I just really want to emphasize that what I'm saying now is based on a deep battery of evidence and, uh, you know, be happy to send uh, uh, papers and books and so forth on the subject. But the first thing is to say that the U.S. just has a really uh, remarkable, there's been a huge amount of attention on potential democratic threats coming out of Washington, D.C., the January 6th insurrection attempt, uh, uh, corruption and uh, the potential of, you know, uh, the big lie and election stealing at the presidential level. But really, the U.S. Constitution puts democratic institutions, it puts election administration, puts districting, it puts police powers and vote counting and sort of election subversion all at the state governmental level. That's constitutional in the US. And that's actually really uh, unique around the world. So most other countries, including ones that have federal institutional structures with multiple levels of government like the US, so countries like Germany, Mexico, India, they don't put all their constitutional authority for democracy at this lower level. So what we're seeing now, which is consistent with issues of democracy throughout American history, especially with regard to civil rights for black and indigenous, indigenous Americans, and you know, the franchise for women, is that these things first uh, uh, create a polarization between states. So uh, the polarization that we're seeing now that's mentioned by my co-panelists about how accessible the franchise is, how fair districting is or gerrymandered districts are, um, these sorts of issues vary now across states much more than they did a generation ago. Now there's a massive difference between your ability to vote and how much your vote counts for a majority in a state legislature or for a house seat, depending on how gerrymandered your district is. If you live in a state like mine, Washington state, or a state that's undergoing a long-term crisis like North Carolina now. Um, and that's similar to the dynamic in Jim Crow and before that the slavery period where states varied in whether or not you could own other human beings through chattel slavery and whether you could fully disenfranchise black Americans as well as women where uh, the women's franchise expanded state by state before the constitutional amendment. The difference between democracy and uh, you know, Washington state and North Carolina is much smaller than the difference between pre-1964 and 1965, you know, Alabama and Illinois. This is not uh, fully disenfranchising you know, an entire, uh, uh, you know, subpopulation of the U.S., but this is a serious gap, and my work shows this quantitatively. So um, that's a crucial issue. And then, as usual, the question is whether Congress, so historically, the pattern has been states and often enabled by the Supreme Court, for example, through the uh, uh, Shelby County 2013 decision that eliminated parts of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and then the Brnovich decision more recently, they enable state legislatures to attack democracy through state legislation and administration. And then it's up to Congress to decide whether to step in and standardize democracy across the states or not. And that's where we're at again now. There's a, a, a democracy reforms on the congressional agenda. And as usual, it's going to take the national government to step in. And overall, this just is another sign that it's really crucial to centralize uh, democratic enforcement at the national level. Because currently what we have is a decentralized system that allows some anti-democratic coalitions to take power in some states and uh, in really extreme ways, gerrymander districts suppress the vote and potentially subvert presidential elections. So all of this is crucial. The uh, push for uh, national legislation is really crucial. And then the other thing, uh, my research also focuses on building uh, sort of movements for democracy. And one underemphasized thing I just want to really say is that uh, uh, the expansion of democracy in the mid 20th century in the U.S. through uh, the civil rights movement and beyond 
um, relied in large part on what we all know, um, the uh, bravery of civil rights marchers and freedom riders and so forth, um, SNCC and Southern Christian Leadership Conference and so forth, and also the labor movement in the US, which produced a multiracial coalition that served as a bulwark for against democratic backsliding. And what some of my other research shows is that the decline of the labor movement has actually really enabled and created a new politics of white racial resentment, which is producing main democratic threats uh, in the US now and is central to the January 6th insurrection and so forth. So having uh, uh, on the ground grassroots organizations that allows people across racial lines to pull in the same direction, create identities that are not based in cultural and racial resentment, that is crucial for protecting democracy and I think is underemphasized. And we're again seeing attacks on labor through policy in the states as well as uh, Supreme Court rulings too. So uh, Congress also has a role there. Super looking forward to uh, uh, Q&A and uh, dialogue with my co-panelists um, and much more to say. Thanks, Jake. That was great. That was great. Mimi, I want to come back to you. Two questions uh, suggested themselves to me. Uh, um, uh, one is, I was interested in what mitigation you were able to win in the Texas bill. I think probably people don't know that. Uh, and then, you know, uh, relatively quickly, obviously, on both of these counts, uh, how hopeful are you that the legal challenges to the, um, both to the redistricting and to the omnibus bill, you know, can be successful? Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you again, all my panelists. This is fascinating. Um, so the some of the uh, main uh, provisions we were able to mitigate, there was um, one of the original bills, a provision that would have uh, keyed the placement of polling places to uh, registered voters. And while that might sound okay on its face, because of historical racial discrimination, we have disparities among who's registered to vote and who's not. And, you know, talk about like, I mean, Texas is going to be probably the last state to have online voter registration. So we also make that very difficult. Um, and so that, that provision would have had the effect of literally taking polling places out of poorer communities of color and putting them into richer, whiter neighborhoods. So we were able to kill that. We were also able to kill a provision that would have prohibited um, voting before 1 p.m. on Sundays, which serves no purpose anybody could ever come up with other than to uh, attack souls to the polls, which is a, a popular, particularly among black churches, where you go to church and then you go vote as a community. So those are, and then thirdly, there was um, provisions that would have really lowered the threshold for allowing a court to overturn election results, which for all reasons, everybody who was, has been alive in the last year understands that was also um, quite terrifying. Um, Am I hopeful? So look, we've had some litigation success in Texas. You know, I think one of the things I'm most proud of at um, TCRP had a lawsuit that was successful under the National Voter Registration Act that was able to force Texas to provide voter registration with online driver's license transactions. That sounds super wonky, but it is translating right now to 100,000 additional registrations every single month. So massive. Um, I think our lawsuit is going to be able to strike down some of the worst provisions in this new bill, especially those around that limit the assistance that vulnerable folks uh, can get and um, probably chip away at some of the vague um, cr new criminal penalties around um, something called vote harvesting, which looks a lot like get out the vote efforts. Um, redistricting. I mean, to be honest, I am a lot less hopeful. And I have to say, I mean, because of the um, decisions that Jake mentioned, um, you know, the Supreme Court has really taken away a lot of our legal tools against um, uh, bad redistricting maps. And so I, I think that that is going, those, those maps are gonna be a lot harder to successfully challenge. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Tova, I'm going to come back to you and, you know, let you sort of, uh, you know, start the, the, the questions, but I do want to sort of ask Randy just to say just a quick um, thing about what the state of things is in Arizona, because I think that's another state where a lot of national focus has been, national attendance, uh, attention rather, has been focused, um, but it's not clear what's happening in, other than that crazy audit. 
Yeah. What isn't the state of things in Arizona? <laughs> I'm really, I really would love to get to a place where we get on calls or things. And I'm like, Arizona is so cool. We're doing all this great stuff. And we are, I, I will tell you, there are incredible leaders here that have totally changed our state in the last 10 or 11 years since SB 1070, more than half a million new voters registered. And just like we we're saying earlier, all this infrastructure has been built from nothing. We had really very little civic infrastructure here until Folks were so tired, they were so pissed off, and their families were threatened with deportation or worse, right, that they stood up and built this by themselves. So that's why we were able to raise the minimum wage in 2016. That's why we were able to pass uh, measures to increase public education funding. That's why we were able to kill some of the worst bills. There were much worse bills on the table than there were ones that passed this year. And the ones that did pass were awful. Um, you know, there was a bill that passed this year that kicked uh, 125,000, uh, 150,000 folks off the permanent early voter list and ended our most popular um, way of voting. And that's up for legal challenge right now, too. But I think to, to Mimi's point earlier, I mean, I think we have to really acknowledge the depth of the planning and design by the opposition that so many avenues over time have been taken from us to actually do our work at a high level. Like, I think that we are really seeing some of the end game from like a 40, 50 year plan. And it really is frightening to watch. But what gives me hope is the work of people, like I said earlier, Blanca, who's holding our Senator accountable to keep our family safe and other folks who are holding our, our electors accountable. Um, so I really am hopeful. And then one point that I would like to make just on something that Jake said earlier about like differences between states, right? Like one state over in New Mexico, California, this way, it might be a totally different way to vote. It's also on a municipal level, right? State election administration is so diffuse across the board. We have 15 recorders here. Wisconsin has 1,850 municipal clerks. You could be three blocks away and operate in a different election system, right? So it, it's so crazy where we've gotten to, and that's why we really do need a federal solution. I think preclearance with the John Lewis Act is actually much more critical right now than HR1 seems to be. We need that kind of protection restored. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Yeah, just a really go ahead, quick Jake. I saw you, I was going to say, I saw you nodding. So go ahead. Jump, jump right no, I here. think Randy makes a great point. So it's really unique to have not just 50 election administration systems, but thousands of county level administration systems. And it's just, it seems like it's riskier to put election administration centralized through Congress and a, for example, federal elections agency. Like after the Trump era, people really are afraid that, you know, a would be autocrat would take over that administration. But ironically, that is actually much more secure than having very long term sort of anti-democratic capture of various states. And just to reemphasize gerrymandering again, this is so crucial. It expands already the partisan bias and sort of like natural gerrymandering where Democrats are clustered in cities and waste their votes and Republican votes are much more efficient. But a state like North Carolina or Wisconsin has more partisan bias in its maps for state legislative seats and for U.S. House seats than any time in U.S. history. And that includes the Democratic Party when it was the main anti-democratic force up until the mid 20th century. It did gerrymander districts, but nothing like we've seen now. It's actually uh, very serious. And Congress could ban gerrymandering right now. Uh, they can uh, uh, place really any of these provisions from HR1, uh, the For the People Act, as well as uh, the John Lewis R Voting Rights Act into a uh, potential compromise bill. The filibuster sort of stands in that way. Great. Okay. Uh, Tova, any questions that you have that you want to share with us? Um, yeah. So, um, one thing I just will pick up on something that um, Randy was. By the way, about. I should say, let me just say I'm going to make sure that we come back to all four panelists to get for give you your concluding remarks before we uh, before we end. So, but I want to make sure that we do get some of the audience questions in. Kendall, I'm um, sorry, we want to make sure we go that way. So, really, I I am somewhat familiar with the Lucha story and the SB 1070 story, and I remember being peripherally involved. That there was a real. I mean, there was really coming from no civic infrastructure you know, very few organizations to end, you know, over the course of 10 years, or I guess less, having a really powerful group of civic organizations that were able to, to fight the fight. And I wonder um, if all of you want to talk about the role of building more enduring civic infrastructure in a state as, um, as a really important component in, in trying to build up pro-democratic policies. 
Uh, go ahead. Who wants to take it? Kendall, why don't we start with you, actually? Yeah. Um, so I do think it is, at the end of the day, the only way we're going to get change. I mean, as we've all acknowledged, for any of these states, for all of this, every time the only way to, uh, to fix this issue is to have Congress and have a national, um, have the federal government step in. But we have to acknowledge that we are not in the same place in the federal government that we were in the 60s. So the Supreme Court's not the same. The, um, it, the Congress is not the same. And those are actual institutional barriers here. Um, and so, yes, we need to address that in Congress, elect people who will care, and then address the issues in the Supreme Court, but that is a multi-step process in a way. And yes, we still need to push for the bills that are actually pending. Um, but this is a situation we're in here, wherein I don't know if a Voting Rights Act, in fact, I do know that the Voting Rights Act in the same way of 1965 would not be able to pass it up, um, be upheld in the Supreme Court that exists today. So it's this is the reality we're living with, and it doesn't help anybody not to acknowledge that. So understand that and then go, what can we do? So one, yes, still focus on that, still push them. It is part of our responsibility. But going beyond that, we need to focus on getting people involved in the state level, getting people involved at local levels and building civic engagement um, infrastructure as Tova was mentioning. So you need people voting locally, voting on statewide levels, and it is across the board, participation at more local levels is lower, significantly lower. Um, and people don't understand how much power those governments have. We talk about, uh, um, Jake just mentioned how much power county governments have in our elections infrastructure. County government is possibly the most opaque part of our government system in the country, um, here in New Jersey and across the board. People know their mayor, they might know their state governor, at least their governor, they might know their federal officials. Nobody knows who's, uh, who's um, on their county ballot or who's, um, who's running the system there. Those are things that are really crucial. So on our end, it's a lot of, we have to do more on civic engagement. We have to talk about issues where people are, talk about the, uh, the power people have and what people can, uh, what individuals can do to engage with them. So how do you do that? I mean, it's, it really is about finding what people care about and then giving them options for how to address it. We put out this thing last year during the George Floyd protest about vote on policing where we just listed out, hey, here is in New Jersey, different areas of the government and what role they have on policing in the state. Just use that, talk to people where they are. You can't get people to come to you and care about the issues like you do. I love the vote. That doesn't mean everybody else sees the point of it, but they care about other things. They might care about climate. They might care about policing. They might just care about having streets that are paved and that's okay. And it's especially important to go do that with communities that are often left out of the vote. So yes, undocumented people, yes, more d disabled uh, communities, yes, marginalized communities. Black and brown voters are the first on the chopping block on um, when we're talking about this. Young voters, talk to them, see what they care about, and then bring it to them. Don't force them to care about a Senate race if they're not there. Yeah, let me, let me jump in because I agree with all of that. And I would just say, when we're thinking about how to build sustainable movements at the state, well, how to build sustainable movements. I mean, I think you have to be investing at the state level and something at the Texas Civil Rights Project, you know, we say that we are the lawyers for the social justice movement. And when we say that, we acknowledge that, yes, you do need lawyers, you need law and policy analysis as part of that movement, but you also need a public education and mobilization. And all of these things have to work together. And actually one of my, um, you know, one thing that gives me hope, and there's a lot that does give me hope, but one of our best projects, I think, is something we call democracy from the ground up. And we work with a whole host of um, usually very local community organizing groups in the um, most populated counties. And we look at, you know, local voting reform issues and what local officials can do. And TCRP, you know, we've drafted up blueprints um, so and we'll talk to the county attorneys and let them know what's in their power. And then the organizing groups will start making the phone calls and say, remember when I knocked on your door last election? Hey, you know, I'm going to turn people out at this action. You know, we're going to start asking you questions in the press. And we're able to do all of that together. And we've actually, in 2020, amidst everything, 
we got um, 99 new reforms passed at the local level across the state of Texas. And, and those wow. do have significant impact. And then they also at the same time actually help to educate and bring more people into the fold, which itself, you know, continues to push forward. Yeah. I mean, I think an interesting thing, I'll just make a very quick comment, is I think that there is more and more recognition of the essential um, essentialness, I guess, of grassroots organizing and building coalitions in the states, et cetera. I mean, I think clearly, you know, what happened, what happened in Georgia um, in the election, you know, really woke people up. Actually, Arizona was in the in a very similar position in terms of the, you know, how it all played out uh, to to the to the consternation of some people. Um, so, and and I think people are looking at Texas in in somewhat the same way. So, I want to congratulate all three of you for like you know sort of moving that. Tova, any other, anybody in the, in the queue here? Yeah, um, so one thing is um, about, uh, so there, one thing is that people wanna hear a little bit more about issues around returning citizens and felon disenfranchisement and the split in the states on that issue. So I'll, I'll start there for a quick one and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to a broader question that a bunch of people have been asking. Okay, Hannah, you wanna start? What's, what specifically are people curious about? <laughs> Let me ask that question. Um, about the role that that's also playing in the divergence in the states. I know that there's been a lot of movement on these laws, um, but there's still, I think, a lot of discrepancy in um, how states treat people who have had a felony conviction in their past. So I, that's, I think, what we're trying to get at. Yeah, absolutely. I love this topic. Okay, so one thing to remember, felony disenfranchisement for the vast majority of states happened before, during, or right after the Civil War. It happened for a reason. Um, and then when you think about right after the Voting Rights Act, we have mass incarceration. It, it, they're not coincidences. There's a reason why currently we have over 5 million people in the country disenfranchised because of this the, um, around the country. And all of it overwhelmingly are black and brown people across the across the country, including right here in New Jersey. And it's because, and it's one of those things that most people across party lines actually agree that there are problems with our criminal justice system, that it is it needs reform. But we can't, for whatever reason, it doesn't connect that all of the problems in that criminal in our criminal justice system, which happens in every state, all of the racism in our criminal justice system, we import right into our democracy when we connect that to the right to vote. So the historically, the push has been to continue to restrict that all the way to 2000. When the, um, um, we've been restricting that, when Massachusetts um, took away the right to vote for incarcerated people. The last six, seven years, um, not even a whole decade, we have been seeing a genuine push in the other direction. We are right now in the middle of a movement across the country and it's actually exciting to be part of it. We are seeing more and more states start restoring the right to vote to people on parole and probation like New Jersey did. Um, you are seeing even red states um, do, um, um, acknowledging the problem and um, chipping away at these issues. So Kentucky, Iowa, um, gov Kentucky and Iowa's governor um, restored voting rights to some people um, so that they were disenfranchised for life. Take a second to think about that for life. Um, Louisiana, we're seeing moves there, but we still need to go keep going. This is just the beginning of the fight. We need people, we need to actually completely turn back the dial here and let everyone um, um, have the right to vote. Why? What? How is it that we have this, um, any sort of democracy where an action you take, whatever action it might be, takes away a fundamental right for a citizen? How does that make any sense? on top of all the, um, all the racism. Maine and Vermont have never denied people with criminal convictions the right to vote, never. They chug along just fine over there. <laughs> and coincidentally or not, definitely not, Maine and Vermont are also demographically the two whitest states in the country. This is where we are. DC, Puerto Rico also lets people who are incarcerated vote, but we, you know, we disenfranchise Puerto Rico in a lot of different ways. DC was the first jurisdiction in the country who um, who just restored fully restored the voting um, right to vote to incarcerated people. It's exciting. They did it last year, um, and now we need to see which state's going to act first. 
we're pushing in New Jersey, but a lot of states are pushing. There's um, efforts in Illinois, in um, New York, in Hawaii, in Washington, all over the country, people are really trying to get this. And it's coming in so many places from formerly incarcerated people who say, we need a voice, our friends need a voice in this process because at the end of the day, you should be able to vote for your school board election, for your kids' school board election, even if you're away. It lets you have a connection to your community. Um, so when you come back, you have that connection and it's important. So yeah, that's where we are on this broad issue in the country. I just want to, another hopeful note, we're not having a you know, um, realistic conversation about um, reenfranchising folks who have committed, committed felony offenses, but I'm really excited to say that at the local level, we have had some progress getting polling places in county jails where most people have not been convicted of anything, which is one of the many problems with our criminal injustice system. But that's been something exciting that even in, in Texas, because of the work at the local level, we've been able to achieve. See, this is this is where it just it really becomes incredibly informative is learning about the creative ways that people are still managing to have successes and forward movement, even under really bad circumstances that we need to continue to share. I just wanted to ask Jake um, to maybe put this in an even bigger picture than he has, which is, you know, people are talking about that our, our democracy is falling apart and, and we're in danger of not having any democracy. Um, and you talked about how decentralized our system is. Is that what kind of a contributing factor is that? And and you know how do we cope with that? Just even in 2022, 2024, where we have this completely disparate system, and you know whether you can vote or not, and how easy it is or whatever, all depends on your zip code. Right. Thanks, Tola. Let me let yeah, me go say very on. quickly, Jake. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. It's a very broad and good question. So, Jake, you, I'll consider your answer the first of our concluding remarks, and then we'll go uh, to the rest of the panelists. Sounds great. You um, can I go a couple of minutes after five, but I want to, but uh, we start to drop shortly after that. So, keep going. That was a great uh, question from Tova, and great uh, related question in the chat or in the uh, Q and A window. Um, so, uh, uh, there's a number of reasons why this decentralization really does put the U.S. at democratic risk. And it seems counterintuitive now following 2016 through 2020 when it seemed like, you know, taking over D.C. was very plausible. But so Hennel made the exact point. People don't know their county or they, they don't know how to vote in state legislative primaries. They don't know how to vote at lower levels. Ironically, we know most. You know what Joe Biden and Donald Trump are talking about. Like that is a real thing. And despite uh, Donald Trump winning a significant votes, that is a more informed decision for people to vote. And it's not, and that lack of information, the decline of state and local journalism over the past uh, uh, couple of decades with the internet, this has been crucial for allowing uh, uh, large corporations, wealthy, rogue, billionaire individuals, groups like uh, in the chat, the American Legislative Exchange Council, Americans for Prosperity, um, other groups like that, uh, uh, sort of politicians themselves, all basically do things without voters being able to hold them accountable or monitor them. And they control election administration at these lower levels and they decide who their voters are, especially for, in the case of the Democratic Party, in primaries as well. This is all really crucial. So actually set this large number of elections, the US has so many elections and such little democracy, this actually makes people participate less in politics, ironically, as research by folks like Lisa Miller shows. This is just, uh, all across the board, it is really crucial that, so again, people on the panel are shouting out such inspiring work done at local and state levels, but the point is when you have national power, centralize it and make lower levels of government less relevant over the long term. Use it while you have it at lower levels, but over the long term, move away from this decentralized system. But for the moment, in the meantime, to you know, keep active at the local level, educate people on the local level, so that um, absolutely yeah okay uh randy uh anything you want to say about arizona or anything you, or your general remarks yeah well thank you so much for having me this has been such a fun conversation i'm pretty sure i could keep doing this it's actually early here it's only two o'clock <laughs> yeah. um but but you know i think there's so many different interesting pieces to this and so many different pieces of this puzzle that we have to play with but i will say as a movement we don't really have a lot of time often to think <laughs> or strategize or breathe or heal or go through the process, right? Like, I think, we, I think we've talked a lot about the inspiring and amazing stories of folks on the ground. 
but like they're holding up the weight of the world right now with like very, very little. And that's not how a functioning democracy or system should ever work, right? Like these folks should not have to do the work that they do to hold people in power accountable that they elected. They should just do the right thing. Um, and that's just never been the case. And I think that's a multi-party problem, right? That's a power problem. It's a capitalism problem. It's a white supremacy problem. It's a patriarchy problem. I mean, we can go on and on about this. Um, but I think, you know, thinking about where we are heading into next year with elections and thinking about where we are in this, in this moment, I, I really think we need to step back and assess who we are as a movement, who we want to be as a movement, uh, and where we want to be like in 10 years and 20 years, not just where I want to be tomorrow, but we have been in survival mode for such a long time. And some folks have lived their entire lives in survival mode. Um, you know, going back to the point about how important local governance is and folks, you know, not having the information, that's also by design, right? So like, we now, I think, have this privilege in our roles and on this panel to step back and look at this. And 99.9% .9 of the population will never have that opportunity, right? So what are funders doing to invest in state-based organizations and local organizations that are actually building that community power? That has to shift. I mean, there's so many different pieces. Um, but I will just say, I've been in Arizona uh, for seven years. The movement here is so strong and the movement in Texas is so strong. The movement in Georgia is so strong and it's not going anywhere. It's not going to disappear overnight, but we do need help, right? We cannot do this by ourselves. We cannot organize our way out of voter suppression, right? I think we're heading into an election year where the deck is stacked against us and every single person, no one's coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. Um, and so all of us working together, building community, building coalition and talking more, I think is an excellent way to get there. So thank you for this. Uh, I hope that we had 150 folks still on hanging out with us. I appreciate that. Um, and just, I, I feel very privileged to be here and do this work alongside you all. So thank you for having me. Great. Hanno? Yeah, thank you. I'm so glad to be here having this conversation too. Um, I'll just say that, you know, as I started with that, the vote it, voting is about power. Um, and that's just something you have to remember in this conversation. And when we talk about what it means broadly, and I, I love how Randy framed it, there's an everyday part of this and then the strategy of where we want to go. So every day, you know, in New Jersey, we have a lot, a lot left to do. We are in a good place, much better than a lot of other places. And I'm grateful for that. But yeah, you know, we need, we're still trying to get same day registration. We want to restore voting rights to incarcerated people. We have a lot of other barriers here that other states have. We have off year elections, as Jake was talking about, off year elections have terrible turnout. We have this thing called the line, which I'm not even going to go into Google it, but it, it, it is truly, truly a problem in our democracy um, in New Jersey. Um, so there are, there are ways that people in power will constantly, constantly try to keep and uphold power by subverting democracy, mm -hmm. um, because it's the easiest way for them to do that. So when we're talking about a broader sense of where we're going, and I'm going to touch on a couple of questions people pointed out um, in the Q&A going, well, you know, I think, you know, broadly, people agree that people should have the right to vote. But when you start talking about incarcerated people, when you start talking about people under 18, when you start talking about non-citizens, it becomes a different question. Maybe that's a little too far. Maybe. <laughs> uh, but the point is this, the people who are restricting the vote, they have a line. They want some people to vote. They don't want other people to vote. Your line is here. You're like, these people, great, let them vote. But those people, maybe not. At the end of the day, as I said, the issue here is that as a culture, we're not quite there. We never have been that we truly believe in the fundamental right to vote. If you do, then that's it. Be skeptical of every single barrier, every single day, every single time there's a barrier for any purpose, registration, polling place, any of those issues, who gets to vote and who doesn't, ask why that is. Does it make any actual rational sense or is it just some random answer you've given yourself to make you feel better about who gets to have power and who doesn't? So that's the broader conversation I think everyone should have and everyone should think about when we do this work. Um, and it's, it, I'm lucky to be doing this in New Jersey and grateful, but it's still something we gotta do here because all of those things, access all of that, happens the worst for black and other voters of color, happens the worst for more marginalized communities. So are those communities you care about then talk about this in those ways. Design voting laws that talk about access in those ways. Is this, hey, this is a great law broadly, but probably it works the best in suburbs <laughs> in reality. Whatever law you're talking about, vote by mail, early voting, um, anything, it works best in suburbs. Is it working in diverse areas, multilingual diverse areas? Uh, all of those things are small restrictions and then there are bigger ones. 
figure out what your line is or should you have one at all? Obviously I'm on, uh, I'm on the side of you shouldn't, probably most of the panelists here are, but that is the broader conversation that everyone needs to have for the, uh, for the future to see where we will be 10, 20 years from now. Great, thanks Hennel. And Mimi, you, get, you have the last word here. All right, well, I'm gonna go on that theme of power. You know, I like to remind people that in 1920, after white women were given the ability to vote across the country, um, some white women used that newfound power to actually go into the labor movement, to go into the civil rights movement, to actually fight more broadly for our society and actually chose to share that power. We know there were plenty of white women who decided not to. They chose to vote for exclusive zoning. They chose to vote for, um, you know, to dismantle public education. They chose to hoard their power for themselves and their family at the expense of everybody else. And so I would just remind, I'm telling you, if you are on this call watching the Zoom, you have power, I can guarantee it. And just remind yourself that. And I think, ask yourself to Hennel's point and the point that was made by others, you know, what are you going to do right now to try to share some of that power and actually bring us closer to the ideals that our country was founded on, but that we've never realized? Great. Well, listen, let me thank all of you for a really, really great and lively as all get out panel. So uh, thanks. It's terrific. We, by the way, we, we are planning to have a, um, a panel uh, in the in the early part of next year, specifically on redistricting as it goes along, and uh, we'll invite all of you back either as panelists or as observers, and uh, and we're we're really really good. Uh, Tova, do you want to make a quick announcement about the twenty fifth? Um, yeah, well, it's a bit information, but we and we will continue this conversation too because if you know me, then you know I will have this conversation. Um, but we are doing another um, event in a couple of weeks on the idea of rethinking our constitution and how we might go about doing that by learning from other countries that have done that and also um, uh, uh, tribal nations and how they have re reconstituted their constitution. So start opening up that conversation about whether the constitution is working and how we might look at it differently. Great. Anyway, thanks again. And just a reminder, this uh, we have recorded this. It will be up on the Ash Center YouTube panel. Uh, and we will keep people informed as new events as they come up. Anyway, thank you very much. We have a huge amount of work to do, but with people like all of you, uh, gives me more hope that it will actually get done. So thanks a lot uh, very much. And thanks for all of you for joining. Uh, 